What's going on everybody? Johnny Bannon here with Trepa Technologies and today we're going to be filming and recording Domain 1.5 of our Network Plus N10-009 course. Not in the studio today. I'm actually in my kitchen recording but that's okay. We're still going to make it happen. So in this exam objective it's going to be actually just honestly pretty boring because it's just going over connector types, different kind of standards that there is no way to make this uh, unique or fun. We just got to go over some definitions and some use cases, and that's going to be, be this domain. There's going to be a section in domain 1.5.2 going over connector types, and there's, there's really no way to be like, oh, yeah, so exciting, connector types. We just got to go over it, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. So you can see our objectives here. So we're gonna go over wireless and wired standards first. And this is again, just going over the basic standards, not getting into any specific uh, examples, just, hey, here's the 802.11 cellular and satellite standards. Then we're gonna get into wired standards. So we're gonna get into ethernet and then the different types of ethernet cabling. So fiber, regular coax, right? Uh, uh, unshielded, shielded twisted pair, things like that. And then we're going to go over the different transceivers that we can see in our data centers and networks. And then the different connector types that we'll have on fiber or on our copper uh, wired 802.3 standards. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is Wi-Fi or wireless standards. And that is the IEEE number 802.11. So IEEE 802.11, that is the wireless standard. Uh... This is the different speeds, the different frequency ranges, the different channels that Wi-Fi can operate in. So the 802.11 standards were developed by the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. IEEE, when you hear that as a network administrator, really anyone working in IT, you should automatically know what that is. That's our standardization organization that creates and sets standards for technologies globally, okay? So this defines the protocols for wireless networking or Wi-Fi. So this is gonna specify how data is transmitted over wireless networks. And this chart here, and as we go through the slides, we're gonna go over the different uh, stages of Wi-Fi, the different kind of levels, and see how the speeds have increased and the evolution of Wi-Fi and how it's gotten stronger, faster, and more reliable throughout the years. So you can see the first generation here, 802.11, released in 1997, that was just Wi-Fi. And it was in a 2.4 gigahertz range. That's channels 1, 6, and 11. You know, you put 2.4 gigahertz uh, omnidirectional antenna in the middle of a football field, it just spreads, right? 2.4 gigahertz has that longer frequency range that's going to allow it to just reach distances. But it's not as strong. And when you say strong, the frequency, since it's longer, not a tighter frequency, right, with more, like, uh, cycles, um, you don't get as much bandwidth, and we're gonna see that. So the max data rate there is two megabits per second. And then 802.11 Bravo, that was just the increase of our 2.4 gigahertz range. And then we had Wi-Fi 2 standards, which is 802.11 Alpha, which brought in five gigahertz. So five gigahertz had different channels, bigger channels, where if 2.4 gigahertz, that frequency range had uh, 11 channels, Technically 14, but we don't need to get into that. At 11 uh, channels. 1 and 6 and 11 were non-overlapping channels, and it gave you a 22 megahertz beam, or beam width. With 5 gigahertz, you get 40 megabits or 80, excuse me, 40 megahertz or 80 megahertz channels, beam width, right? So you get more bandwidth, you get better transmission speeds with that. So the first iteration of the 5 gigahertz range was 802.11 alpha and we got 54 megabits per second now the downfall it has shorter range because it has that tighter frequency the tighter cycles right uh it can't go through objects as well and it doesn't cover distance as well and then we have 802.11 g and i guess i'll move on to the next slide here which operates in 2.4 gigahertz band but offers higher speed so this was hey okay uh, now we can kind of match 5 gigahertz. Now we can have that distance with 2.4 gigahertz, that longer trans, uh, wider footprint, but now we can go up to 54 megabits. And that was a standard for a while. And then in 2009, we came out of 802.11n, Wi-Fi 4, and that gave us both 
frequency ranges, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, and it got up to 600 megabits. Then we had Wi-Fi 5, 802.11ac, that was just the 5 gigahertz range. So again, with that, we had some improvement with the distance it can cover, because even though 5 gigahertz range can't go through objects as well, if you put more wattage, more power, this kind of understanding our fundamentals, you can increase that range, right? So our access points kind of caught up to that. And that's Wi-Fi 5, 802.11ac. And with these Wi-Fi standards, we're not going over security, but as we get into it further along, I just kind of want to preface, Wi-Fi 4, 5, and 6 saw the introductions of WPA, WPA2, WPA3, respectively, and different encryption standards for that, which we're not going to talk about, but just so you know, you might see like Wi-Fi 6, it provided WPA3. So we'll get into that later. And then finally, the last iteration that we're going to talk about in this course is Wi-Fi 6. That's 802.11ax. That's, again, both ranges, but up to a max data rate of 2.4 gigabytes per second. And those max data rates on the right are, like, theoretical, guys. They're, like, potentially, or what is possible in a very, uh, in a lab environment with perfect conditions, Wi-Fi 6 can get 2.4 gigabits per second of data rates and throughput. Okay, there's a lot more that goes into that, like uh, 256 QAM, how we're modulating the frequencies, those cycles, uh, MIMO, so much we can talk about with wireless that we're not going to get into in this section. You just need to understand those standards. So pretty much we got to memorize this chart, okay? <laughs> Moving on, now let's go over cellular standards. So cellular networks provide wireless communications from your cell phones, those SIM cards, the antennas in your phones, and it's been through lots of different evolutions. So currently we're on 5G, and actually, I just remembered, I want to make another point. Wi-Fi 7 is currently out right now as of this recording. It wasn't on the exam objectives, but if you want to go look it up, go look it up. Wi-Fi 7, I think it's 802.11be, Bravo Echo, uh, has increased the data speeds, and it's just another evolution of Wi-Fi. Not on the exam objectives, but just wanted to point that out. Now with cellular, we're currently at 5G. And with 5G, they get this gave us the ability, honestly, to have even business-grade cellular networks where ISPs, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, are offering biz, ISP services now just based off their cell towers. So 5G really enhanced our cellular data throughputs, gave us the ability to do ultra-high definition video, to stream multiple things at once. 4G LTE was kind of the first one that allowed us to stream video, uh, but it's not as fast, right? And you can see the different evolutions of cellular networks here. And then we have satellites. Something that's actually very important now, especially with the introduction of Starlink, providing high-speed broadband internet to remote areas where before a satellite service would cost so much and the speeds were not good, the latency was not good. But now satellites become part of like our redundancy plan sometimes for business. Uh, for remote workers, especially that are living out there in the woods that don't have to deal with now crappy mountain ISPs, right? So with satellite networks, we have three main orbits we're going to talk about. So low Earth orbit, that's going to be something like Starlink. That's going to be the most relevant that you probably know about with low Earth orbit constellations. We actually have MEO, not pictured in here, medium Earth orbit, that there really is no commercial product for that. If you're talking about a lot of government uh, communications, which that's what I did in the military was a satellite communications operator. There are some use cases that we're not going to talk about in this uh, certification exam. Then we have geostationary. So geostationary is going to be the highest orbit we have. That's 35,000 kilometers uh, above the equator. And that's going to give us kind of not, that's going to give us the widest footprint on the earth. So a single satellite in geostationary orbit can give us a much, much larger footprint than a low Earth orbit satellite can, but you're not going to have the speed advantages. Because of the distance that a ground station antenna has to travel, 35,000 kilometers into space, you have so many different vari uh, variables that could affect that transmission, that could interfere with your speed, you require a lot of power to get up there, um, and the latency. So transmit and receive in a geostationary orbit is at minimum the latency 240 milliseconds up and down. So total 480 milliseconds. So even though there's broader coverage, you lack the speed 
you lack the bandwidth, it's way more costly, and there's a lot more factors that you have to deal with, and a lot more frequency ranges. Like the bands you would typically see in geostationary are, well, super high frequency range, and it's going to be like KU, X, KA band, C band, and there's just a lot of other elements and variables with that. With low Earth orbit, lower latency, less footprint per satellite, but as long as we deploy constellations like what Starlink did, you actually get a lot of coverage. Okay, now let's talk about 802.3. This is our wired standards. This is going to be IEEE standard 802.3. This is Ethernet. So Ethernet operates in the data link in the physical layer, and it's actually going to encompass 802.2 and 802.3 standards, and it supports bandwidths of 10 megabits to 100,000 megabits per second. As you can see, we have this nice Ethernet cable comparison chart that says, hey, the Ethernet technology, which gives us, which tells us how to encapsulate data on the wire and up to the data link layer, layer one to layer two. We also have these cabling standards with cat five to cat eight connectors that give us different speeds, but still using the Ethernet technology for encapsulation. So as you can see here, uh, the different 802.3 standards that we're going to talk about on the Network Plus exam, 10 base T, 100 base T, 1000 base T, and 10 gig base T. Pretty much these are different standards within 802.3 that are going to tell you how much bandwidth we get and what kind of cabling will support that increased bandwidth. With like 10 gig base T, probably going to be fiber. There is copper cabling that can accomplish this, like twin X, which we're going to talk about, I think, in the next section. But when we get into these one gig and above, there is copper uh, connectors and cabling that can handle this. But Ethernet is still for fiber as well. So we have a lot of fiber cabling that can also encapsulate via Ethernet that can give us those increased speeds as well. Okay, and now to jump into fiber, so single mode versus multi-mode. So fiber is going to use light, beams of light to transmit data. So it goes at light speed, right? And there's two main modes, single mode and multi-mode, and they have their use cases. With single mode, that's for a long distance. As you can see in that photo there, the way fiber works is it has that, uh, that cladding around it, and then they have that glass core. That glass core is what the light's gonna go through. And with single mode, it's a single laser, and we get a lot more distance with that. Because it's not bouncing up and down like multi-mode, which is gonna attenuate faster, we don't get as much signal loss with single mode. So that's gonna be if we want those long haul communications with hundreds of miles or kilometers between data center to data center, pop to pop in our ISP, we're gonna look for a single mode fiber. Multi-mode fiber is gonna be what we use in the enterprise, in our campus, in our data centers for high speeds within a geographical area. So multi-mode, as you can see, has that bigger glass core that's going to shoot those beams of light and they're gonna bounce up and down. So we're gonna get bit, we're gonna get more signal loss there. Okay, then we have direct attached copper cable. So that's gonna be like twin axe cable. So this is a type of DAC cable with two inner conductors that share a common shield. And main purpose of this is we get those high data rates, but it's a short distance. So that's what I was telling you, yes, there is copper solutions that can accomplish these really high speeds, but the problem is the distance. So you see a lot of times twin acts in a data center rack. If we're connecting our storage area network to our compute chassis, so our storage to our compute chassis, we want those high, high throughput with copper, we can use twin acts. And then we, of course, we have coax cable. This is going to be what you commonly see uh, into your small office, your home office. Business solutions as well also use coax into that modem. And we're going to have standards in America called DOCSIS. And those DOCSIS standards are going to say what kind of uh, coax you want to use for certain upstream and downstream speeds and the number of channels you get. So it's going to have those different standards. We have two types of coax cables that the Network Plus exam wants to talk about. That's the RG6 and the RG11. So RG6 is commonly used for cable television and internet connections, where RG11 is used for longer runs in broadband internet and cable TV installations. And it has an even thicker conductor and more shielding so you don't get as much attenuation or signal loss over long distances. RG6 is going to be what you're kind of used to coming in your house. RG11 is going to be more on that like service provider side. 
Okay, and the last thing we're gonna talk about in this section is plenum versus non-plenum cable. And this just has to do with like a disaster rating when it comes to uh, f like fires, right? So plenum rated cables, when we're talking uh, unshielded, shielded twisted pair, even coax, it's that jacket that's covering those copper cables. Is it fire resistant? Is it rated for that? Is it gonna produce less smoke and toxic fumes when burned? So we're gonna have plenum versus non-plenum cable. So plenum cable is used in air handling spaces to comply with fire codes and reduce the risk of smoke inhalation in the event of a fire, just safer in case we do have that disaster like a fire. Non-plenum cables, also known as riser cables, these are used in vertical spaces between floors and are less expensive, but they're not fire resistant. So they're gonna produce a lot more toxic smoke and catch on fire a lot quicker and spread a fire a lot quicker in our buildings. All right, now let's go ahead and do our quiz. Okay, so we're in our Network Plus uh, course here on our learning management system, and let's go ahead and do this quiz. So question one, and I'm gonna move my face over here in case I do wanna clip this for our social media. So question one, which type of cable is specifically designed for use in air handling spaces to comply with fire codes and reduce the risk of smoke inhalation in the event of a fire that's going to be a plenum cable. So that's going to be our fire resistant, fire coated cables. Question two, which of the following best describes the purpose of direct attached copper cables? So it's not going to be long distances. It's not wireless. It's going to be to connect network devices over short distances within data centers. It's not going to replace fiber optic cable. It's not the main purpose, but you do have those two solutions, right? Multimode versus DAC in a data center. Which generation of cellular technology introduced support for high-speed data transmission with speeds up to one gigabits per second, enabling mobile internet and video streaming? So I do think that this is actually talking about uh, 4G networks, because 4G, I believe, could get up to those speeds, um, but it could be talking about 5G as well. Let's see, I believe this is gonna be 4G here, LTE that is. So yeah, that was the first one that could theoretically get up to one gigabits per second because 5G can go up to like 10 gigabits per second, right? So uh, that was kind of, that was a nice tricky question, something that CompT would definitely ask. All right, question four. Which of the following IEEE standards is specifically designed to operate exclusively in the five gigahertz frequency band and offers speeds up to several gigabits per second. So I know this is like Wi-Fi 5. Uh, that's gonna be one that operates exclusively in five gigahertz, but that is 802.11ac. So Wi-Fi 5, but this is the IEEE standard, 802.11ac. AX is Wi-Fi 6, and that's gonna give better speeds with both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz enabled. Question five. Which of the following cables is most commonly used for broadband internet and cable television due to its superior shielding and ability to transmit high frequency signals over long distances? So over long distances. So we're gonna go with RG6 here. And then last question, question six. What is the primary difference between single mode and multi-mode fiber? That's gonna be B. That single mode fiber has a smaller core diameter used for long distance, that single beam of light, while multi-mode has a larger core diameter used for shorter distances because that uh, light beam is kind of bouncing up and down in multi-mode. All right, guys. So look at that. We are 100%. Let me come back here. And that's going to be it for Domain 1.5.1. Do not forget to like and subscribe and stay tuned for Domain 1.5.2.